Thank you so much for coming here today. It's my pleasure to be here. I joined uh, three months ago this wonderful community uh, and uh, I'm really happy and excited to be here and I'm going to show you uh, today a little bit of the uh, uh, work that allow me to be here and uh, in, I'll, I'll try to give you a flavor of where I want my group to be in the next few years at least here at Stanford. So I want to start with uh, some historical, what I call historical analogies. So I put in this graph here the, the pressure of a specific gas, I'm not going to tell you which gas, uh, in, in, the, in the recent, in the last few years, let's say, and you see that the pressure of this gas increased, increased uh, until today. So can you guess which gas this is? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's not CO2, it's oxygen. It turns out that this is a scale on the billions years, and three billion years ago, oxygen was started to being produced by some organisms and uh, that started to do uh, photosynthesis. And initially, oxygen uh, dissolved into the oceans, uh, uh, caused changes to the rocks, and so the concentration of ox oxygen stayed pretty low until it saturated and it uh, uh, reached the concentration that we have today. Turns out that it's, oxygen is really good for us, but it was a dramatic, caused a dramatic change to life on our planet when it started to being produced at that time. So now we have in a different gas, which is also following a similar path. Because if we look at CO2 in the last 400,000 years, years, there have been some fluctuations and I'm not going to go into the details of the reason for that, but in the last 200 years, we clearly have an increase in the levels of CO2, which are probably caused by uh, the use of fossil fuels, the, uh, the generation of energy through the use of fossil fuels, and uh, these levels of CO2 I've never seen before. So we can create an analogy and say oxygen had dramatic, uh, caused dramatic changes to the planet, what is CO2 going to cause to, to the planet? Maybe something similar. So we need to watch out for that. And um, so this, this brings me to the second question for you. We know that the levels of CO2 rise because of the use of fossil fuels, but we also know that this, in these last 200 years there have, there have been tremendous improvements in the standards of living. So we can take our car, go out, go where we want, take our, our planes and go to, to Europe, uh, have our uh, houses uh, cool in summer and, and warm in winter. So this, uh, this changes, this use of fossil fuel really caused some, some positive um, improvements in our standards of living. So my question is, and this is the energy, what I call the energy dilemma. What should we choose for the future? So should we choose to go back to when we had less energy to favor a better environment because we know that this increase in CO2 is causing dramatic changes to the environment? Uh, or should we choose to keep our standards of living? So we still want to have our car, we still want to have our house warm in winter, but we are going to get a worse environment in, in the future. This is the energy dilemma. Well, I hope I'll convince you by the end of this talk that maybe we don't need to choose. We can still, uh, still have the, the, the amounts of energy needed to drive our planet and also uh, live in, in a better envi environment than we have today. However, to get there, that's the energy challenge. We need to get there. And so we need to be able to meet the, uh, the needs of the growing population, and in particular the, the, the growing needs for oil and fossil fuel resources. Turns out that this is a picture from a, an American family in 1970 with all the oil barrels that they used to consume per year. So that's the amount in 1970, and this is probably twice as much nowadays. So we need to grow this, this need, to meet these needs and also be able to provide a better environment because we want people, for example, in China or everywhere to be able to see the sun with their eyes. And uh, we don't want them to need a screen to uh, understand where the sun is rising in, in the morning. 
And uh, this, this concept was very well described by the uh, United Nations World Commission on Environment and Development already almost 30 years ago when they define what sustainable development is, which is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's our energy challenge, to meet sustainable development. So that's my way to put this energy challenge. That's the way I compare this energy challenge. It's kind of a race between nature, which is the turtle in this case, and uh, the hair, which is us consuming uh, fossil fuels at a pace, at a rate which is, uh, that, that nature is not able to keep up with. So we need to find a way to speed up the turtle if we want nature to win this race. And in some way we need to cheat. And we need to make sure that nature is able to uh, produce if we want or um, we need to replace these fossil fuel resources or find a, a fuel that is replaced at a much faster pace than what's, uh, nature, what nature usually does. And what is that, that science that deals with increasing the rate of chemical reaction to produce fuels, for example? Eric introduced that before, that's catalysis. Catalysis is exactly the science of speeding up reactions. And that's probably one of the things that we need here if we want the turtle to win the race. And what is catalysis is represented very nicely here in this cartoon. Instead of uh, climbing this mountain, which is the activation energy needed for molecules to overcome, to be transformed into the products, we can take this, this tunnel with using a specific calyx that take us directly uh, to, to the products with a, a much lower activation energy. That's what catalysis is. So the, the idea here is that we need to develop better catalysts to uh, meet this, uh, this energy challenge. So how do we develop better catalysts? I will use this, this example, this sentence that uh, Gerhard Ertel a Nobel lecture in 2000, sorry, Nobel Prize in 2007 uh, for his pioneering work in catalysis. He used to say, uh, talking about ammonia synthesis, which is one of the most important discoveries of the 20th century. Well, if we read a sentence from his Nobel lecture, he says, large scale technical production of, of ammonia, in this case, would not have been possible without the availability of a cheap catalyst. This task could be solved successfully by Alwin Mitash, who in thousands of tests found that the material exhibited satisfactory activity. And I would point out these thousands of tests. That's exactly the way industry, or even like academia in the 20th century, used to find new and better catalysts, basically just trying. Try the trial, the, the well-known trial and error procedure. You try a bunch of materials and you see if it works or not. Clearly, that's not acceptable uh, in the long term, not just because we are wasting materials, but also we, because we need to solve our issues in a much more compelling way. So that's my vision of how to get better catalysts to uh, tackle these energy challenges. It's divided into three areas. The first one is control, the second one is understand, and the th third one is improve. So nowadays we have, with nanotechnology, the tools to precisely control the structure of material to the nanoscale. And that's extremely important in catalysis because catalysis has always been a nanotechnology discipline well before nanotechnology was even defined. So we have the control over these tiny crystals in the nanometer scale. Uh, once we have this control, we can prepare a library of well-defined well materials that we use to understand the catalytic reaction mechanisms. And we can draw what I call structure activity relationships here. Then we can really understand where the, the active sites are. So we understand the active sites for the reaction. Then we can go to the, to the third task and we can improve the catalytic activity of our materials by, by increasing the density of these active sites once we know what, what they are. 
And eventually we can go back and uh, restart the loop and do it even better. And that's, in, in my opinion, a much better way to find new and better Kali's that to increase the knowledge about uh, Kalitic systems for specific transformations that involve energy and the environment. So during my short talk today, I want to give you three examples of how to control, understand, and improve Kali transformations that are taken from my uh, PhD and postdoc research, uh, trying to deliver this idea of how to use these well-defined materials to uh, understand and improve catalytic reactions that are very important for energy and environmental application. So first of all, let me tell you what type of materials we are going to talk about today. And these are supported systems. It means that we have a small metal particle, usually from the transition series, and a support, which is high-specific surf high surface area, highly porous, and the combination of metal and the support, which is usually a metal oxide in my case, in this case, gives rise to the callus, which we hope is extremely active. And to give you an idea, here I reported three electron microscopy images of supported systems where you have these arrows pointing to the small metal particles surrounded by all the, this high surface area material. So you can understand can have an idea of how complicated these things are with all these different facets, these are all atoms and so on. So these are quite complicated and we want to facilitate the studies on these materials and how do we do that? By controlling. So we go to the first part of my talk. How to control these materials to the nanoscale. And it's been demonstrated in the last 10 to 15 years that colloidal methods, I will, will talk about that later on as well, can uh, result in precise structures under, uh, for, for we, we can control structures um, in, in terms of many elements, many properties. So for example, in terms of size, here we have metal nanocrystals of different sizes going from two nanometers here all the way to 10 nanometers. And these structures are so precise that we can control the, their size down to atomic, uh, to the atomic scale. So one particle differs from another more or less by one atomic layer only. That's the, the level of control that we have nowadays. But size control is not the only control that we have over this structure. We can also control their shape, so not just spherical particles, but we can have elongated particles as reported here for this semiconductor nanorod. But we can also control the composition, which is extremely important in catalysis. We can control the presence of defects that can also um, affect the catalytic activity. So we have a, a very many knobs to turn in terms of control of the, the structures that we can use to then prepare better catalysts. And so I want to give you an idea of how effective this control is for some reactions. And I selected this reaction, which is called methane steam reforming reaction. It is quite simple. You take methane, a very important energy resource, and you treat it with steam or water, and you obtain CO and hydrogen. And um, this mixture of CO and hydrogen uh, is what we call industrially syngas. As, or synthesis gas, because it is used to make a variety of other compounds. And this reaction is industrially extremely important. It's run at very, very large scale. Here we put some pictures of uh, what we call steam reformers. And you see the people here, which gives you an idea of the scale of this reactor. So industrially very important reaction. As I said, with that syngas, we can make a lot of other important things. For example, it is used for ammonia synthesis, and ammonia is extremely important to make fertilizers. We can use it for methanol synthesis, and methanol, again, is a very versatile building block for polymers and a lot of other things, or for higher alcohol synthesis. And in all these cases, we need a specific ratio between our hydrogen and CO coming out of this reaction. Okay? So we need to be quite selective in that ratio. And the way industry does that is by tuning this second reaction step, which is called water gas shift reaction, in which they take a CO, they treat it with an excess of steam, and they can regulate the amount of CO2 and hydrogen. So they can also regulate the, the CO to hydrogen ratio here. Okay, so this is done in two steps. 
So my point is, can we control, instead of controlling this in two steps by controlling the nanostructure, so what we did was to prepare palladium nanoparticles, nanocrystals. Palladium is one of the most active uh, metals for this reaction. In different sizes, I reported here uh, electron microscopy images of these different sizes of palladium nanocrystal going from very small, let's say, to larger. It goes from around two nanometers, about two nanometers to seven to eight nanometers, so still a very, very small range. And then we ran that reaction of methane steam reforming. And here reported the selectivity towards CO, which basically gives you an idea of that CO hydrogen ratio against the temperature. And you see that by just changing the, the, the size of the nanocrystals, we are able to tune the selectivity of the CO to hydrogen ratio that we can get out of this, uh, of this reaction. And in particular, we can go from very large, from what I call very large particles from an hydrogen to CO ratio of roughly three, which would be good, for example, for uh, methanol synthesis, we still need to tune it, all the way to an hydrogen CO ratio to roughly 12, which means that we are approaching the ratios that are better for ammonia synthesis. So the control over the nanostructure in one step clearly controls the selectivity for this reaction. Now, I have to admit this is not extremely important for methane steam reforming because industrially it's one of the most known reactions, so we don't need to, to work on that. But this is just a proof of concept, a demonstration of what control of the nanostructure can do for the selectivity of your reaction. So if you want naively in the future, I can imagine instead of, uh, well, this is it. I'm an engineer, so I shouldn't say that, but instead of engineering all that, that reactor, I can engineer what goes into the reactor here and change the selectivity uh, the way I want. That's where the future can be in terms of tailoring the nanostructures. So now I want to come to the second part of my talk. So we have the control over the nanostructures. What about understanding reaction mechanisms? And so, here I report the rate of one particular reaction. We saw it before, it's the water gas shift, so CO plus water to give CO2 and hydrogen. Again, industrially important reaction. Now, if we run this reaction on the same metal, same metal particle size, but different supports, that, that orange is thing that I showed you before that is, uh, is used to support the particles. Well, if we go from alumina to cerium dioxide, we can increase the reaction rate by 100 times, just by changing the support. Okay, and ceria, cerium dioxide in this case, is well known to be a promoter for some reactions, and it is well used in catalysis, for example, in three-way catalysis, fuel cells, uh, oxygen members, and so on. Now, what, where is the origin of this improvement in the quality activity provided by the support? That's what we want to understand by controlling the, the nanostructure. So the idea was actually quite simple. We have control over the, the metal nanocrystals. So we take nanocrystals of different sizes. We deposit them onto two different supports, such as alumina and ceria, with very different catalytic properties. And we run our uh, reactions of interest, trying to draw those uh, diagrams that I called before structure activity relationships. So I'm not going to be talking about the alumina systems in interest of time, but I will be focusing on the Syria supported systems. So this is again the level of control that we can get in terms of composition and size. We can get platinum, palladium and nickel nanocrystals going from 1.6 nanometers to 12 nanometers. And again, these nanocrystals are very, very similar in size, which means that the size distribution is very, very narrow. So one nanocrystal differs from the other by not more than one atomic layer. And that's extremely important for what we are going to do with these nanocrystals. So then we support these nanocrystals on Syria, and then we study a, um, a reaction which is reported here, CO oxidation. And it's just the oxidation, simply the oxidation of CO to CO2. Uh, Apparently simple, but the reason why we chose this reaction is because A, we know it very, very well because it's been studied for uh, many decades. And second, it's still in industrially important because CO is a toxic gas. 
it has to be eliminated in some way, for example, in the three-way catalyst in your car. So it's still environmentally interesting to study this reaction. So now, here we have the activity of our nine samples. I go back, we have nine samples, three platinum, three palladium, and three nickel with different sizes on Syria. And this is the rate of the reaction of four C oxidation against the temperature, or inverse temperature. Now, this graph is, is pretty dense, but what we need to uh, consider here is just basically that the small nanocrystals uh, reported here with the, with the red color perform better than the medium nanocrystals and better than the large nanocrystals, okay? This is the, the information that we get from this graph. And it doesn't really matter actually what metal we are using, whether we are using the very expensive platinum or the very cheap nickel, as long as the particles are small. Now we want to understand why this happens and to do that we need to build physical models to correlate the structure with the activity. We have the activity, we need a physical model for the structure. So we did that by collaborating with Eric Stock at Brookhaven National Lab. We did very accurate uh, transmission electron microscopy studies of our materials. I reported here three representative uh, microscopy pictures of small, medium and large palladium particles. We use several of these to build our physical model in which we distinguish the, uh, the atoms in each nanocrystal depending on their position, whether they are on the surface as reported here with the gray color or at the perimeter in contact with the support which is reported here with this orange color or at the corner again in contact with the support as reported here in blue, okay? So now if we take this physical model, very simple, and we do just very easy calculation. So this is theory, we are still in the theory. And we report the fraction of particular sites, which for us are the surface sites, the perimeter sites, or the corner sites, against the diameter. We obtain these three lines for the nine samples we had before. This is against just theory, just calculation. Now, because our samples are, yes, some kind of model samples because they are extremely controlled, but we can put them inside a, a realistic reactor and test the, uh, the calytic activity under realistic conditions, we can also extract the calytic rate for these nine samples, which is reported here as turnover frequency at a specific, at a specific temperature. Basically, just a, an indication of how many cycles per second these uh, uh, calyces are able to, to turn over in terms of the reaction. So now if we get that number and we report it here, we obtain this, this black line here, which lies in between the, the model that we built for the corner sides and the model that we built for the perimeter sides. This clear, clearly tells us that the active sites are the ones at the perimeter and in contact with the support. That's where our active sites are. And what this means is that Syria is such a good support and such a good promoter for this reaction because the reaction happens exactly at that interface, at that perimeter. And by changing the nanocrystal size, we are able to change the, the uh, fraction of atoms at that perimeter, at that interface, and so we are able to tune the catalytic activity of these systems. So now that we know that those interface sites are the most active sites for the reaction, we can go back to synthesis and prepare better calyx based on this knowledge. So this is the idea of understanding, after we control, understanding the structures and uh, use that knowledge to prepare better systems. This leads me to the final part of my talk. So we saw how to control, we know how to control the structures. We uh, understand many things in terms of the reaction mechanisms using this uh, very well-defined structures. Now, how do we improve Calis based on that based on that knowledge? And I want to do it uh, regarding one particular transformation, which is methane oxidation. So we know that methane is extremely important nowadays. We have a lot of methane. Uh, it's a very uh, good energy resource for many reasons. What there is one problem with methane? It is an extremely powerful greenhouse gas. And the emissions of, and actually methane as, um, is eight to 72 times more harmful than, than CO2 in terms of uh, greenhouse uh, power. So the emissions of methane are extremely uh, 
bad for the atmosphere, for the environment. So we have to limit those emissions. And even in places where you, know, you think there, there are no methane emissions because you don't see them, if you scan this, these images in, under the IR light, then you realize that there are a huge emissions of methane close to, for example, oil drilling sites and, and so on. But not only, even in, in case of diesel engines, diesel trucks or transportation, there's uh, the production of a lot of methane emissions that cause very important problems for the atmosphere. So this is actually a huge issue. And we know that not only CO2 in the last 400,000 years, in, uh, the CO2 levels increased a lot, but especially with methane, you see this is a vertical line. So in the, in the last hundreds of years or so, the, the, the methane levels rise by three times at least. So this is a huge problem for the environment. And it turns out that methane is an extremely stable molecule because those CH uh, bonds are extremely energetic and that's why it's a very good energy resource, but they are extremely hard to break. So you need materials that are extremely active to break down those, those bonds and transform that into, into CO2 and water, which is what we want to do. So here we don't really need to understand the requirements for the reaction because some other people did that for us. So there are, there, there has, there are a lot of studies on methane oxidation. Here I reported one, for example, but we know that palladium oxide is the best methane oxidation catalyst we have nowadays. And especially when supported on Syria because of the reasons I, I told you before, because of this interface effect, that system is even more active. So the point is, now we understand what we need. How can we improve? How can we increase the density of those interfacial sites between palladium and Syria? Well, our idea was to build what we call core shell structures, in which your palladium is at the core, and you have a Syria shell, and the interface between the metal and the support, in this case, is maximized. So the number of interfacial sites here is maximized, because the, the Syria support is wrapping around the, the nanoparticles. So we developed this synthesis starting from pre four palladium particles all the way to these core shell structures. These core shell structures are still colloidally stable because they are stabilized in organic solvents by these not well-defined organic tails. At least I don't want to enter into the details. So we treat these as molecules. So we can isolate these, co these core shell structures. We can put them in a bottle. We can spray them, we can paint them, and these still contain this core cell structure as kind of supramolecules. So what we could do with this was to take these supramolecules, put them down onto a high surface area support, and see how they perform for the methane oxidation reaction, which is what we did. So again, the reaction is kind of simple. You take methane and you burn it with oxygen to, to form CO2 and, and water, but the advantage is that CO2 is much less harmful than uh, methane in terms of emissions and greenhouse uh, power. So here I reported the methane conversion against the temperature. This is called light off curve for our core shell system here on the top compared to two more conventional catalysts where your palladium is just sitting on top of either Syria or of alumina and with a mixture of Syria around. And there are two important things to note from this, uh, from this light of curves here. The first one is that the core shell structures deliver much better performance because if you see the temperature of, of light off, which is the temperature at which 100% of your methane is converted, this is 400 degrees C for the core shell structure catalyst and the other two systems are still well below 50%. So the activity is much better, as we would expect by increasing the density of these interfacial sites. The other very important and interesting thing is that if you take this temperature window between 600 and 700 degrees C, you have the thermodynamically favored uh, decomposition of palladium oxide to metallic palladium. And we know that palladium oxide is the active side, is the active phase for this reaction. So for example, when you, when you form pal metallic palladium and you decompose palladium oxide to metallic palladium, the activity decreases. And only by increasing the temperature then we are able to see a, a, an increase again in the activity of these systems. So this is found 
this characteristic and the composition of palladium oxide is found for any single methane oxidation catalyst based on palladium out in the literature. Now, if we look at the Korshall system, there's nothing like that. And the reason is because these Korshall structures uh, and the ceria in the shell is able to maintain palladium in its oxidized form even up to very high temperatures. And it doesn't allow the decomposition of palladium oxide, which means that the, the chemistry and the kinetics there are, are different. And uh, not only we have a high activity for this system by engineering this active site, but also this ceria shell forms some kind of a cage around the particles. So the particles, even at high temperatures, don't move around too much. And so the calyx turns out are also very stable. So you can go up and down up to 850 degrees C and there's no decrease in activity or even do what we call a simulated aging. So you keep your calyx at very high temperature for a long time and there is no decrease in activity. So I hope I convinced you that by following these three steps, control, understand, improve, we can get much better calories than we have nowadays to tackle some of the big challenges that we have in energy and environmental applications. And I didn't have the chance to go through other interesting projects uh, that I did in the past related to these small molecules, what I call small molecules, met methane, hydrogen, CO2, but I will be happy to talk and discuss with you about this eventually later during the reception. So with this, I want to thank the people that uh, meant a lot to me in the past, present, and hopefully will mean a lot to me in the future years, uh, starting from my PhD advisor, Paolo Fornaziero at the University of Trieste, uh, Ray Gordy, also PhD advisor at University of Pennsylvania, Chris Murray, postdoc advisor, and my, my current fantastic group. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you again, Theo. Uh, if anybody has any questions, just raise your hand. I'd be happy to. Thank you very much for this very nice uh, summary of your research and also the perspectives what it might do for the environment. Um, one question is uh, regarding the stability of, I mean, the escalatic performance, which you showed is very nice. What is the material stability of the catalyst, of the, uh, of the catalyst you're entertaining right now, in particular the caution catalysts? So it, it depends on the material that you use. So if you're talking about the core shell systems, then we demonstrated that the stability is, is very good and the structures are maintained even up to very high temperatures, as high as 850 degrees C. If you are talking about this well-defined um, nanocrystals, then the stability might be an issue, and uh, we cannot go beyond 500 degrees C uh, if we want to do this uh, structure activity relationship studies. So it depends on the reaction that we are talking about, and it depends on the material that we are dealing with. Um, in, that's that's the general consideration that we have to we have to make. Uh, very nice talk. Um, on the last part that you showed about the palladium and the ceria in a core shell structure, I think you assembled them with some molecules, um, right? If you go back to the picture. You had some here. That's right, and uh, the mercapto. Yes, yes. This is a particular. I didn't have the chance to go to the, right. into the details. Which means that the palladium particle and the and the cerium particles are not in contact, or do you get rid of the molecules? Yeah, that's. Thank you. That's a very good question. So, in interest of time, I didn't have to go through the details, but I have a, a backup slide here. So what we do, we need to activate these materials for catalysis. So we need to remove all the organics before we run our catalytic transform, we, before we run our catalytic reaction. So basically what we do, we calcine. So we expose these materials to air to very high temperatures. So all the organic byproducts are removed. And then what we have to do is to make sure after we remove these ligands that we still maintain our structure. And that's why we did uh, microscopy studies to make sure that that's, that's, the, that's true. 
So what we have here is our alumina calyst and with the arrows are, the arrows are pointing to bright small dots. Uh, and if we do what we call energy dispersive uh, X-ray spectroscopy, we can uh, find out that these bright dots are formed indeed by palladium and cerium. So the palladium and cerium are still there even after we remove all the, all the ligands and, and everything. And then if we do what we call a line profile scan, we can see that the palladium signal comes from inside the cerium signal. So we demonstrate that we still have the core shell structure that is in there. Then further, we do high resolution transmission electron microscopy studies and we find out that we have this very small palladium core, roughly two nanometers, surrounded not by a dense cerium shell, but a shell formed by small crystallites. And so here we have a model of how the, uh, the system is, in which you have your small palladium particle and the shell is formed by these small cerium crystallites sur surrounding the palladium particle. And so there is contact, but there are also small pores here, as you can see in some of the, some of the images, where our reactants can come in, be converted onto the palladium surface or palladium oxide surface, and then uh, be uh, diffused back into, into the stream. Thanks for a very nice talk. Um, you, you, you show a very impressive control of, of your, your surface here uh, by a, a special set of uh, synthesis techniques. How scalable are they? So if, if you don't want to make grams, or I, I don't know how much you make probably mm -hmm. on the gram scale, but you want to make tons, can, can you scale up this? Yeah, that's, uh, so that's another important point. Um, right now, we are able to make grams of these materials in, in the lab. So that's actually already a, a good starting point. So we are not limited to uh, micrograms of uh, materials that can be made with other techniques. Um, the advantage, if you want, of this system is that we don't have injections or we don't have any particularly difficult step during the reaction. It's just what we call a heat up procedure. So there are actually companies that demonstrated that you can make maybe not tons of these materials, but definitely tens or hundreds of kilograms uh, in, in that sense. So there are, for example, companies in, in Massachusetts working on s somewhat related materials, quantum dots, and that has been demonstrated to be scalable with, uh, with the same nice properties up to, again, hundreds of kilograms. And some of these materials were uh, introduced in, in TVs and some other devices, so it's, it's not hard to believe that this can make uh, their way into the market. Do we have some other questions? Just more on the stability of the um, Syria shell. Mm -hmm. So Syria is a, it's a compound that it often undergoes oxygen exchange depending on the uh, partial pressure of oxygen in the environment. Um, have you ever done a study, or maybe I'm sure there's studies out there, about how that affects the stability of the palladium or yes. whatever's in the core? That's, that's a very good question. Unfortunately, I don't have the backup slide, but the, the thermal treatments actually turn out to be extremely important for the reactivity of the systems. And the chemistry of these structures is quite... Um, quite different than conventional systems. So it turns out that when these uh, samples are calcined to too low temperatures, and I mean 500 degrees C, the syria is too reducible. And um, it causes some deactivation issues that are not permanent, uh, but still important. And only when we increase the calcination temperature to temperatures as high as 800 degrees C, we're able to obtain something that is more stable. And at that point, we obtain something that is more similar to conventional Syria, in conventional high surface area Syria in terms of oxygen storage properties. So there's a, a different chemistry going on into this system, which, is, which was one of the exciting things of these core shell structures. Maybe I missed it, but can you talk a little? I'm way back here. 
Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I sorry. couldn't see you. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what the um, practical applications you see for this kind of a fabulous catalyst? Well, um, there are pr practical applications. We can, uh, we can use the, the control uh, over the, the nanostructures to improve, for example, the selectivity of specific processes. Or we can uh, use the compositional control over these structures to, again, improve selectivity and activity toward these processes. Because basically the idea is, um, what if you can control these structures really down to the atomic scales, then you have very, very well-defined active sites. And if you know what these active sites are doing in terms of catalysis, then you can control the, the entire catalytic process. So practical applications are in improving catalysis that we have today already by increasing the density of the active sites that, and we know what, if we know what those active sites are, or make new catalysts for new processes by tuning the composition, the, the phase of these systems, and by understanding how that affects the, the, the catalytic activity. So I think the practical applications are, are several. Uh, so we are not actually, in that sense, we are not creating a new uh, catalytic approach. We are just controlling that much better to understand how to improve the catalytic systems, and we prepare those uh, catalytic systems that are that show much uh, much improved activities. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, great. So let's thank Matteo one more time. Thank you. Thank you very much.